coin from last Sunday's scriptures and message. So let's turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer as we prepare to worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> A lesson from the book of Micah. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who bring my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against those who put nothing in their mouths. Therefore it shall be night to you without vision, and darkness to you without revelation. The sun shall go down upon the prophets, and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced, and the diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Hear this, you rulers of the house of Jacob, and chiefs of the house of Israel, 
who abhor justice and pervert all equity, who guilt Zion with blood and Jerusalem with wrong. Its rulers give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets give oracles for money. Yet they lean upon the Lord and say, Surely the Lord is with us. No help, no harm shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be proud as a field. Jerusalem shall be a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house of wood a wooded height. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the shoulders of others but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues, and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi. For you have one teacher, and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Sandra, my back feels even worse than my front oh. feels. <laughs> if, you want to, if you want to stay, you're welcome to stay. Thank you. It's up to you. I, I forgot to tell you that. Sandra is also going to be reading the, the prayers of the people for us this morning, and she, she graciously kind of got volunteered. I volunteered her for it, so thank you, ma'am. Much appreciated. Would you pray with me? Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. It is an unspoken lesson in every seminary and in every church and in every family that sometimes it is more difficult to keep the main thing the main thing than what we realize. And from time to time, we need a reminder that in ministry, whatever form of ministry God has called us to, and we each have a ministry, we need to be reminded from time to time that it is all about Jesus. I don't know if you all remember the movie The Bishop's Wife. It's an old black and white Christmas classic. And David Nivens plays the, the right reverend Henry Brougham, uh, 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 an, an Anglican bishop, by the way, probably, I think, is supposed to be set in New York, if I'm not mistaken. 
His wife is played by Loretta Young, and the angel that comes to correct what is going wrong with the building of a new cathedral is played by, of course, Cary Grant, and the angel's name is Dudley. There are three things that are going wrong as Dudley is sent by the Lord to get Bishop Henry back on track. There are things that are going wrong with the building of the cathedral because they're focusing on stuff that doesn't give glory to God. He has to deal in particular with a, an older lady who is very, very wealthy and in exchange for donating mightily to the construction of the cathedral, she demands that the stained glass window that depicts St. George have the face of her late husband. Okay? On top of that, the attention that the bishop is giving to the building of this cathedral is taking away from the attention that he's supposed to be giving to his parishes, to the parishes and the flocks under his shepherd, shepherd leading. And St. Timothy's parish is about to close because nobody's paying attention to what's going on and how they can be helped. And then, closer to home, Henry's wife and daughter are being neglected because of all the time that he's putting in with the cathedral. And she is, his wife, is feeling the neglect in particular. And so Dudley comes as a messenger from the Lord to say, Henry, you're a wonderful man of God, but you're forgetting what you're supposed to be doing. You're forgetting what your ministry is all about. That's what we read about in today's gospel lesson, in our Old Testament lesson, and in our epistle lesson. Uh, in fact, what we read today is really and truly the other side of the coin to what we read last Sunday. If last Sunday was about making sure that we are open to welcoming whatever God is wanting for us and whoever God is wanting for us, then the other side of the coin is to be sure that every time we're welcoming something into our lives, into our midst, we also have to be sure that it's exactly what Jesus wants. We have to be sure that we're not putting something we want in place of something he wants. And so as we, as we look at the scriptures today, we have to remember that as with Bishop Henry Brome, we can fail to see the will of God and to do the will of God, not so much because we intend to mess up, but because we begin to worship something other than God. We see this with our Old Testament lesson today, don't we? Look with me, if you would, on the bottom of page 5. I'd like us to take a few of those passages and, and do a little picking apart this morning. There are some who worship a life of spiritual ease and moral laxity. And so they turn their actions in, and their words in that direction, and they tell others that God doesn't really care so much whether we're doing what he calls us to do in the word. It's really whether we're doing what we think is right. And so, we have the prophet Micah being sent to the people of Judah. And look what is going on here. Starting with verse 5. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against those who put nothing into their mouths. In other words, the prophets that are preaching and teaching are preaching and teaching that you can get your own 
and not worry about anybody else. Not what the Lord wants us to teach. Not at all. Then looking down at verse 9, the Lord says through the prophet Micah, Hear this, you rulers of the house of Jacob and chiefs of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and pervert, pervert equity, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with wrong. Its rulers give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets give oracles for money. Yet they lean upon the Lord and say, Surely the Lord is with us. No harm shall come upon us. Israel has this nasty habit of following after other gods, after false gods, idols. And then coming back to Jerusalem or to Bethel and saying, Oh Lord, we love you. Even as they're still offering sacrifices where the Lord has told them not to offer sacrifices. Make no mistake, when we stray from the clear instructions that the Lord gives us, we tend to pervert righteousness, justice, and equity. They all fly out the window. We put an emphasis on being open-minded and exploring things that the Lord has told us not to explore, and then it only follows that we're going to go down roads that will lead us to act unjustly and unrighteously. God gives us a package deal. It's been said that America, and I would also argue Western Europe, is full of cafeteria Christians. We pick and choose what we like, and we leave the rest behind. In fact, there was an entire movement in seminaries in the early 1900s called Neo-Orthodoxy that did just that. There are only certain parts of the Bible that are reliable, and the rest, well, it's nice literature, but we don't have to listen to it. Look what it's gotten us. A church divided. We are living the fruit of what generations of theologians have taught and put into the minds of pastors and parishioners throughout this country. We have perverted justice and forgotten equity because we have forgotten that the Lord tells us everything we need to know. Jesus continues, and he points out that there are some who worship the feeling that comes with being religious, having all the trappings, having the perfect worship service or the perfect mass on Sunday, and the vestments are all done perfectly, and, and the altar is set up the way it should be set up, and, and we say all the right words, and we sing the beautiful music. And we do it because, frankly, we want the glory. I've been in churches like that. If I ever get to the point where I start sounding like that, run me out of here on a rail. Seriously. Because that's not what it's about. <coughs> Jesus says, if you look with me at the gospel lesson at the bottom of page 7, the very last line on the bottom of page 7, Jesus has to tell his people, his chosen people Israel, he has to tell them with regard to the Pharisees and the scribes, do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They're hollow. They're hypocrites. 
They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. God's law was intended to bring all of his people closer to him. It was intended to be something that the family of Israel did together. Encouraged one another in. Lifted each, up, each other up in. And he goes on to say, they do all their deeds to be seen by others. They love to have their place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbis. The first time that I wore my collar to Walmart, got quite a few looks. Had one person, uh, a young man who was stocking shelves, uh, say to me, and he thought, I thought that I was in his way, and it turns out I wasn't, and he, he looked, at, he must have seen the look on my face. He said, oh, Father, don't worry about that. Just come on again. And, oh, I was just... Yeah. And then I remembered, wait a minute. This collar is a sign that I'm a prisoner for Christ. Not to be exalted. The crosses that some of us wear not a way of declaring to the world that we're better than somebody else. It's a way to declare that we are a follower of the one who laid his life down for them. And that we know that we're called to do the same thing in a various and in sundry ways. We're called to do the same thing. And so if some people worship a life of ease, and if others worship the feeling they get when they worship, what is the model that we as the family of God are supposed to be emulating? Well, number one, as we discovered last Sunday, we are to be radically welcoming. We are to, to invite anybody and everybody to come to church because we are all sinners, and we, apart from the grace of God, <coughs> can do nothing to save ourselves. God loves us, and God will transform us if we allow him to. And so, the other side of the coin has to be what Jesus says in the very last sentence of the gospel lesson, verse 12. Actually, the last two, the, verses 11 and 12. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humble, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is what Paul picks up on in our lesson from his letter to the Thessalonians. Look at me, if you would, at the top of page 7. I know we're skipping around today, and we're getting into it. Listen to what Paul says. This is the model of ministry. Part two. After we welcome them, then we have to have the same kind of attitude and the same kind of motives that Paul is outlining in his letter. He says, uh, beginning halfway through uh, verse nine, so that we might not burden any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. We worked night and day, says Paul, so that we didn't have to take anything from you, but only give to you. Paul came into this not to get something out of it, not a feeling, not a recompense of any financial sort, nothing. He was a tent maker missionary. 
He had a job in addition to preaching the gospel, and I would argue that it was because he had a job beyond preaching the gospel that he was more effective in preaching the gospel because he knew what people were dealing with. He understood their lives. And then jumping down, you are witnesses and God also how pure, upright, and blameless our conduct was toward you believers. Paul and his companions strove to let God guide them in all of their actions and in all of their words so that they would be humble and that they would be true. Then he goes on to say, As you know, we dealt with each, of you, each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God. They treated the folks they were trying to, to bring into the faith not as co-workers or neighbors, but as family. As family. So important were they to Jesus that they were that important to Paul and his companions. We constantly give thanks to God for this. They lifted them up in prayer. When they came into contact with somebody who didn't know the Lord or with somebody who was a new convert to the Lord, they were sure to sustain them in prayer. Have you ever really thought about what it means to keep somebody close in your prayers? That's a difficult thing. To try to remember throughout busy days and busy weeks and busy months that all morph one into the other, to try to keep people in the foremost of your mind who need your prayers, it takes concentration and it takes self-sacrifice. Which is why the church has given us tools with which to do some of these things. You ever wondered why it is that Catholic Christians, whether Anglicans, Romans, or Orthodox, are called to not eat meat on Fridays? Because it's a, ten, it's a reminder to us that our Savior, the precious Lamb of God, died for us on a Friday. And every time we have a hunger pain for something to eat and we go to the refrigerator and we start to take out some lunch meat or maybe that leftover meatloaf from the night before, it's a reminder to us that that Friday is a special day and that we abstain from something in honor of what Jesus has done for us. When we fast, when we engage in the spiritual discipline of prayer and fasting, why is that? Because every time we feel a hunger pain, whatever it is that the Lord is wanting us to pray for in that prayer and, and fasting time, it's a reminder to pray again. We need these things. We need these tools. And Paul is saying, we kept you close in our prayers and then he says, finally, for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? Yes, you are our glory and joy. So completely and so deeply have they given themselves over to service to the Lord <coughs> that they understand that they are the crown of glory that they will wear when Jesus returns. So if we welcome radically, we have to love deeply. And if we love deeply, we have to speak truthfully. We cannot tell falsehoods 
because we want to live an easy Christian life. And we certainly can't live smugly as though somebody who needs Jesus is beneath us. Beloved, wanted, people who will love Jesus so deeply that they will speak truthfully in love to a hurting world. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have loved us so completely that you give us the grace to do likewise for those you bring into our lives. Sometimes we can speak gently and sometimes we have to speak truthfully even when it might hurt. Help us to do these things. Help us to understand that sharing the fullness of who you are will mean a radical commitment to the people you send us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. you to stand as you're able as we confess our faith this morning. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For Christ's holy church, that Robert, our Archbishop, William and Frederick, our bishops, all priests and deacons and all lay people would be strengthened in their mission of sharing God's love in a hurting world. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. for our nation and all who are in authority over us, that humble thoughts and actions would trump cheap talk and self-seeking motives 
in our political deliberations, and that those elected to positions of leadership would exercise their authority with godly care and restraint. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the welfare of God's world, that those who are hungry would find nourishment, that those who are engulfed in the horrors of war would find peace, that those who lack honest work would find fruitful employment, and that those who lack faith would see the face of Jesus in their midst. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the needs of our communities, that the care of our neighbors, family members, and co-workers would lead us to act generously and sacrificially, that our thoughts and attitudes would be filled with godly love for those around us. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who suffer and those who are vulnerable, that we, would, that we would be filled with godly courage and fortitude as we care and advocate for those on our prayer list, for those who are sick, the hungry, the careworn, the preborn, the elderly, the lonely, the fearful, and those who are grieving. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have died in the faith and fear of the Lord, for the repose of their souls, that they may stand before Jesus offering him praise and glory, and that we may follow in their footsteps, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, <coughs> mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God and one another in a moment of silence as we prepare to receive the absolution. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us continue worshiping as we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings and come to the holy table.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of heaven. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, which the fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. <coughs> Receive, O Lord, these gifts presented by your people for the work of your church. Invite you to stand as we sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Lift up your hearts. We, we lift, lift them, them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. 
And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, where with the Blessed Virgin Mary, blesses Mary and Martha of Bethany, and all your saints, we enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him that takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. Beloved, the gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
stand as you're able. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Thank you.